Hello, I'm Rupert Soskin. And I'm Michael Bott. And this is the Standing With Stones Megalithic Podcast. This podcast is only made possible by monthly donations from our listeners who have supported us through Patreon.com. You can become one of our patrons for as little as a dollar a month by visiting patreon.com slash standwithstones. So, welcome to our fourth podcast on all things megalithic. Well, maybe not all things megalithic, that would be a bit, bit silly, but as much as we can squeeze in anyway. <laughs> yes, this month, along with our regular items, we'll be discussing that old conundrum, when is a stone circle not a stone circle? Oh, that old chestnut. When it's a circle of stones, you fool. Um, not that the chestnuts come into this, I don't think, anyway. <laughs> So, as usual, kicking off without pushing back the boundaries item, with all due respect to people that really do dig things up, <laughs> what have we dug up this month? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny how things suddenly become news when research has actually been going on for quite some time. Uh, maybe it's because the field archaeologists don't put things out to the public until research has been you know, wrapped up and papers have been published. But in one of our news feeds last week was a paper from 2013 about the oldest known rock art in North America. It's in Nevada, actually, at the dried up Winnemucca Lake. Great name. Well done. Um, and these petroglyphs could be as much as 14,800 years old, which is pretty staggering, really. The, the most recent date, because there's still tests going on, the most recent date could be 10,500 years old, and they're, they're still trying to refine those dates. But one of the complications is that uh, at whatever point in the past, the stones had been completely submerged in water back when it really was a lake. So the dating is being calculated from the deposits on the stones that were laid down while it was in water. And then they're somehow trying to figure out how much further back in time, so when they were exposed, when they were actually in the air, how much further back in time they were actually carved before they were swallowed up by the lake. It is one of the toughest things in archaeology. It must be trying to get a date on rock art, you know, anything that's just scratched in the surface or ground Absolutely. in the air. Absolutely. I, I just, I take my hat off to their skills and the technology involved. It's amazing. But the thing is, apart from their age, there's another reason that these petroglyphs really stand out, and that's that they are, considering their age, these are fantastically complex. And you know, many of them are just as sophisticated as those that you'll find at places like Nauth. Oh, really? In, and Newgrange yeah. in Ireland. And and the thing is that, you know, unless we've got the dating completely wrong in places like Nauth and Newgrange, you know, this level of artistry just it doesn't just appear overnight. You know, so once again, we're left with even more tantalizing questions about where did these people come from? Bearing in mind their age, and we're talking about in North America, which is already mm. contentious enough, you know. Yeah. So where did these people come from? And where else might we find their art from nearly 15,000 years ago? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I haven't seen images myself uh, of this. What, uh, is it comparable in sort of style to other rock art we know, or is it unique well, to itself? It's To me, it, it, what it really smacked of was uh, was like a lot of the rock art in Nauth. Oh, really? That was my overriding impression of them stylistically. And the reason I asked the question, because you know, one of the current theories about rock art in North Dowth Newgrange is that um, it comes from um, entropic designs, I, that is the um, uh, designs that are uh, automatically uh, produced by the brain uh, under the influence of certain drugs. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. I. I don't know what to say about drugs from fifteen thousand years ago. Well, exactly. Um, we we can't, can we? 
but mm. I just asked the question just to throw that little pebble in there. You know, if yes. there is a similarity, then maybe there's a similarity of cause. That's just that was just my thought off the top of my head. I hadn't thought it through. <laughs> it may of it you what you will. <laughs> just another one to toss into the mix. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So that's my pushing back the boundaries for for this month, anyway. That so, uh, and as usual, we will have links on the website. So uh, those of you that are interested, uh, you know, you can have a look at uh, some of the just beautiful designs, actually, um, geometric and sort of organic designs. It's uh, it's amazing, really, that they're that old. Wonderful. Thank you. So, into the news. What's our first news item this month, Mike? It's hooray for common sense in County Westmeath in Ireland, where after a long battle between conservationists and peat extractors, peat extraction has been stopped to protect a Bronze Age oak road running through Main Bog. Authorities have ruled on a protection zone around the site so it can be properly preserved. Well, definitely hurrah. But, uh, but uh, what, what's the story with the Oak Road itself then? Apart from the conservationists doing wonderful things, what, what's with the road? It's a, the, the road itself seems quite astonishing and uh, you know, uh, quite unique. The road is constructed with huge, massive oak planks and runs for... 657 metres through the bog. Good grief. And it's six metres wide. So, you know, it's easily big enough for wagons to pass side by side. Wow. Um, uh, it seems it's the largest of its type known anywhere. It was actually discovered back in uh, 2005 by a man taking his dog out for a walk. <laughs> well, it's never happened to me We're taking my dog for a walk. But... It's, it's, it's taken all this time for any preservation orders to be uh, put in place. Wow, ju okay. Just, just a little bit of context. Um, the, so we've got a Bronze Age oak um, road, uh, six metres wide. The modern standard for two-lane roads, traffic going in each direction, is... 5.5 meters to 7.3 meters <laughs> and um if it's a bus route the minimum is six meters so it's the same <laughs> thing. uh so yeah that's quite a considerable width to so, so allow. hold on so are you suggesting then that our our modern road and vehicle dimensions were actually established five thousand years ago yes that's exactly what i'm saying <laughs> that's hysterical isn't it awful, though, how a temporary pursuit of cash can have permanently damaging effects on archaeology in situations like this? Yes, it seems to be the world we live in. But uh, anyway, not in County Westmeath this time. So, ta-da! Yes, to all yeah, the fantastic. conservationists and officials who work to put that through. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, talking of roads wide enough for vehicles, um, I've got an exciting one for you. No, uh, an exciting one, is it? It is an exciting one, yes. The we never do an exciting ones, do we, Rupert? <laughs> the Archaeological Survey of India have found the first ever solid evidence of chariots, and by chariot I mean two-wheeled Ben-Hur-style vehicles driven by one person, from 4,000 years ago. Oh, uh, so this is actually the first solid evidence of chariots anywhere. They're the, the closest. It? Um, it, well, basically, it puts them in line with it. It's the oldest chariots in that part of the world. We've got chariots in the Middle East. Ah, right, okay. Um, so basically, it puts them puts them along the same timeline as, uh, as say, the Mesopotamians. Cool. That kind of thing. Uh, but um th these excavations they're in uh, Sanauli village which is near um Bagpat i hope i pronounced that correctly um and work is still ongoing but they found some amazing stuff uh they've uncovered eight burial sites Ooh. with coffins not in all the eight burials mm -hmm. but i think there's three coffins that they've uh, that they've found but swords and ornaments uh, but the thing is, the chariots have copper motifs and ornamentations. 
Uh, plus the coffins are also decorated with copper. Wow. And those decorations include human figures with leaf crowns, which you just can't deny is suggestive of royalty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, th th this puts India well into the same warrior class for that period as, uh, well, as we, as we just said, as much more well-known civilizations like the Mesopotamia. I did read up a little bit about this, and there seems to have, the discovery of these chariots seems to have pro provoked a, a little bit of controversy, because if it is assumed that horses drew this chariot, then it challenges uh, the established orthodoxy of the introduction of the Vedic culture into India, in that it came from the Aryan invasions of 1500 BC or thereabouts. Yeah. But if there were horses in India or being used in India in 2000 BC, that rather upsets the notion because it's only in Vedic culture that horses are mentioned. They're not mentioned in, in India up to that time. Do you know what? I, I hadn't even thought about that. Mm. I hadn't even thought about that. But but they they found uh, weapons and a helmet. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I can't <laughs> I can't imagine charging into battle uh, on a chariot being pulled by a br <laughs> a brace of cows or bulls lumbering into the fray. That uh, would be back to the drawing board <laughs> quite quickly. The, but the thing is, how long do you think it would take a civilization to go from domesticating a horse to using it in warfare? I mean, you you might just have changed the history books by by maybe a thousand years. I I bet you not very long. You know, because in many ways, a lot of our technology, uh, you know, modern technology, gets born out of the military, uh, out of uh, uh, the, the pressures of uh, of, the, of military. Sadly, nearly all of it's born out of uh, military. Yes. But anyway, digging up copper chariots—that's um, every uh, archaeologist wet dream, really, isn't it? Oh God, just. I, I can't imagine, actually. I, I cannot imagine the thrill. Mm. Or, you know, you, you, you get, you're so used to digging up um, general odds and sods, you know, whether it's bits of pottery here and there and what have you, that to come across something, it's almost reminiscent of uh, when they opened Tutankhamun's tomb, for example. That sort of thrill yeah. must have been amazing. Yeah. Really? Good on them. Yes, yes. Do you, do you think it's like detectorists spending countless hours of ring pulls and discarded forks just for that occasional euphoric moment that makes it all worthwhile? Um, it um, does take a certain character, I think, to <laughs> carry on digging stuff out of the ground. Anyway... Um, you, yeah, well, yeah, you almost have to wonder whether everything else would be a disappointment after finding yes. a real tro treasure trove like that. So, um, anyway, um, back to you, old fruit. What have you got? What else have you got there? Well, this is new news on old news. And do you remember Ertzi, the Copper Age Iceman they found murdered in the Italian Alps back in 1991. I certainly do, yeah, yeah. As we probably all know, they spent years analysing Ertzi himself and discovering all manner of things about his shabby state of health, how he died, uh, that the arrow which killed him was still lodged in his body, that he might have had Lyme's disease, so many different things like this. All the reconstructions do have him looking a, a little bit ropey, you know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he needs to feed up a bit look, by the looks of it. <laughs> thing is, after all this time, they finally got round to examining his tools and weapons, and some really fascinating details have come to light. A lot of his tools were made from chert which is similar to flint. In fact, if you're going to be picky, flint is a kind of chert. But I digress. Thank God uh, for that. Didn't... I thought you were going to go off on one there. <laughs> I apologise. They did an analysis of the chert and discovered that Ertz's tools came from all over the place. Uh, various locations in Trentino. And if you bear in mind, they're fairly sure that Ertzi himself came from 
uh, Vinchka, which is uh, which is a valley uh, a fair way to the north. Yeah, where, where can uh, uh, I mean? Uh, are we clear where he exactly he was found? It's in the uh, Alps. Uh, it's in the he, they, he was he was found. His body was found in the Italian Alps. Italian. Oh, in the Italian Alps. Okay. Cool. Yes. Because um, he's got a German name. Well, I think that's because there was a there was actually a fight. Um, over ownership because he was ah. very much on a border, wasn't he? And yes, wasn't there a, yes. a fight between the Italians and the Austrians? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. I think uh, it was right. the Austrians. Sense, yeah. Um, who, yeah, there was a, a lot of um, argy-bargy going on about who should actually take So the Italian-Austrian Alps, sort of. Yes, thing. yes. Okay, cool. So uh, uh, along the line there, yeah. Now, uh, thing, along with this rather lovely and freshly sharpened copper axe, which probably came from Tuscany. That's a few hundred kilometres away. And all of this is indicative of quite lively trading of stone and copper tools over wide distances. And, I mean, that um, in itself, it might not be particularly surprising, but it's lovely to have solid evidence for this kind of social and cultural interaction found with one individual. It makes you wonder whether he travelled you know, himself far and wide, buying tools from traders wherever he went, or whether traders themselves uh, were bringing a variety of tools from different places. Who was doing? Who was doing the moving about? You know, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and uh, you, you can even imagine, you know, big markets. Yeah. where traders came from far and wide and you could buy tools from you know from far flung locations all in one place from those different traders yeah so. and all that all that is going on five and a half thousand years ago and here's something we need to remember though the copper age in europe seems to predate the introduction of copper into britain by quite some period of time yeah in, in Britain at the time of Ertzi, the Neolithic was still in full swing and, and the beaker culture, along with you know, metal tools, didn't arrive until around 2500 BC. I mean, am, am I missing something here? I found if I'm understanding this right, we, we, you know, in Britain, we might have been great with stone at that time, absolute masters in it, in fact. But to our European cousins, we might genuinely have been perceived as being stuck in the stone. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is an extremely good point. Actually, I, I hadn't joined those dots at all. Um, yeah, it's interesting. That generally speaking, the the metal ages, so you know, Bronze Age and Iron Age, they, they tend to appear quite some hundreds of years earlier in continental yeah. Europe and the Middle East earlier than they, they do in Britain. But you're right, this knocks that generalisation out completely yeah. and by a very long way. Mm. So yeah. I mean, you know, the point we're making is uh, it's an interesting thing to appreciate is the culture in Britain was, was greatly differentiated from the culture just over the channel in, in Europe. Yeah. And it yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. until people came over that uh, uh, things changed. Wow. Well, it, you, you, you are clearly on a roll. Uh, have you got another one? Did you really need to ask? <laughs> Funnily enough, we're staying with, well, Sicily, to be precise. At the archaeological site of Castelluccio, they found Italy's oldest known olive oil. Oh, nice. Uh, so that, yeah, well, it's similar to the wine residue we were discussing in an earlier podcast. I can't remember which. Um, but the oil was found coating the inside of a few vessels. This particular ceramic jar was broken, but it has been beautifully restored. And it stands a metre tall with elaborate raised pentagram motifs, and it's early Bronze Age, about four and a half uh, thousand years old. Right. Now, you know what I like about these kinds of discoveries, like, you know, Ertzi's tools, is that it puts tangible flesh on the enigmatic bones of our megalithic sites and we all have these yeah. amazing places that we really don't understand very well at all but here we have completely understandable items from the lives of real people and it's a, a real window into the past yes absolutely yes do you remember how we felt standing by the dressers at Scarabray? oh absolutely i do 
Happy days indeed. Interestingly, there's something I want to talk about later on, and I uh, had the experience of a uh, close encounter with a, a, a long barrow, shall we say, that helped bring at least me a bit closer to understanding about uh, yes. uh, the real problems of real people you know, doing real building back then. Anyway, on to this month's main topic. Stone circles or circles of stone. Mm. How on earth did we come up with this? How did you come up with this? Did you come up with this? Did I come up with this? I can't remember. I, I, I think over the years we probably both have at different times. But what what set me off uh, this time really was that we've talked about this off and on. And one of the things that really came up once again for me was I was reminded of the time when, and this was way back before we were actually filming Standing With Stones, oh, right. that we yeah. were both, um, you know, we were both off wrecking in different places at different times. And I was on Dartmoor uh, and, and I'd gone to Round Pound, yeah. uh, which is uh, not too far from Scorrell over, over that way. And, uh, and as we see so often, there were prayer ribbons and other such items, let's say, uh, that were tied up in the uh, in the shrubs and trees around Round Pound. And the yeah. thing is that Round Pound, well, it's a farmstead, really. Yeah. You know, th- this was a place that was, uh, you know, it was pigs and cows that were kept there. There was nothing religious about it. And yet people uh, have these um, relationships with sites that uh, – you know, and, and 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 I can be a grouch and say, well, they've got it wrong, but but in some ways, maybe that's not even relevant. You know, mm-hmm. that it's mm-hmm. how people relate to uh, our past is very much their their own affair, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it, it was that incongruence that really um, kicked me off, and you know, and and making the point because I'm sure there's an awful lot of people who who haven't actually. Um, separated in their own minds you know they, they see stone circles and they think stone circles well, but sometimes yeah i mean that that's a, the distinction circles. between um what is known to be um uh, you know a, a practical place uh, um, to do with animal husbandry uh, and something that we may more romantically um associate with spirituality uh, you know and yeah. Fair dues. How how are we to know? But what what, what uh, sparked off in your mind the distinction between um, a, a stone circle and a, sto- a circle of stone? You know, where's the dividing line for you? Does, does that make well for for me the dividing line is are they are the stones very carefully and evenly spaced? Yeah. Has an awful lot of time and effort gone into? making these positions absolutely spot on. So we know, for example, the uh, the uh, 19 stone uh, sites or the nine stone sites, um, you know, that we know are to do with lunar astronomy, yeah. for example. Uh, so their positioning is absolutely critical. In comparison with, uh, with somewhere like, uh, multi uh, you know, up in the uh, in the Welsh hills, where that's just a ring of stones. That's probably a very large hut circle. You know, they were probably uh, here we go uh, stones that were supporting uh, probably wooden post walls. And actually, that's, that's- it was standing in the ring of multi that I remember having this conversation. While we were filming, standing with stones, yes, I remember we probably did. Uh, standing there with the the sheep wandering by and the uh, clouds <laughs> scudding across the uh, mountains in in the distance. Um, yes. I think that's when we really had the first real conversation about the distinction between stone circles and a circle of stone. Um, yeah. Because <clears throat> yeah, multi chuff the stones are really really close together yes yeah it's it's a it's a ring yeah isn't it yeah. really uh, and and the, you, know, the, you know the thing that i i suppose i find really fascinating about this distinction is that you can realistically say i believe you can realistically say 
if it's a stone circle, um, so you can take extremes. You can say Stonehenge yeah. is a stone circle. Yeah. It is so intricately, in, <laughs> intricately, it is so intricately <laughs> placed that, uh, you know, there, there can be no, particularly, with, you know, having trilithons above and anything else, you know, there can be absolutely no question about the fact that the positioning of the stones was critical. Uh, then you can look at, um, you know, nine stones on Dartmoor or the nine maidens yeah. or, you know, there's so many where, you know, that positioning. So, so you can set those sites very much aside. We don't know what they were for. We can choose to believe that they were religious. Uh, maybe they were. We can choose to believe that they were astronomical. We know that some of them were, but maybe they were other things as well. But then when you get to circles of stones, that's down to, as you said a few minutes ago, that's down to pure practicality. Yeah. And they can be so many different things yeah. and probably were so many different things. Yeah. When I knew we were going to be talking about this, I had a sort of a quick look through the books, through Julian Cope, you know, through <clears throat> Burl, etc. And... You didn't look through Standing with Stones, did you? I did, of course, I looked through Standing with Stones. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, I mean, the interesting thing is what we're defining here as a, a stone circle are far more ubiquitous, far more of them than that which we define as a circle of stone. Um, I mean, mm. the, the first one that comes to mind is the Rollwright Stones, followed by Multi um, mm -hmm. Castle Rig. Uh, as yeah. You, uh, yeah. Sunken Kirk. Um, at which point, in terms of pure circles, it, it seems to run out. I can't think of that many others. And well, they they certainly um, disappear into uh, a distinct minority, mm. and uh, and and that for, for me is uh, it really underlines the fact that you know one of the reasons I find it so irritating, frankly, said grumpy old man, <laughs> that you know when. when so often, when when a new site is found, particularly in Wiltshire, you know that it's another temple has been found. You think it's oh, no, <laughs> you know, and, and another site has been found certainly. But why do you keep calling them temples? They were, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, and Castle Rig is a lovely example. Yeah, right. The Castle Rig is uh, it, it's a circle of stones. It's, you know, it's a, okay, they're big stones in the main, but it's a ring of stones. And over on the eastern quadrant, uh, there is a, an almost, well, what's the best way to describe it? Uh, it's a, almost a boxed area mm. in which they uh, they've found it was filled with ashes, right? No, no human remains, nothing like that. It's ash. Yeah. So that was the burning area. And I glibly, but actually quite seriously, say that's the barbecue area. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and actually what I genuinely envisage for sites like this What held you back when we were the, making the film, Rupert? What held you back from saying <laughs> to camera, and look, here, here, here's the, here's the uh, yes. barbecue area. Yes, uh, what, yes. What I, could I possibly have, have stopped it. you? Well, <laughs> Well, I think if I'm brutally yeah. honest, I, I think that that um, I can't call it a realization because that uh, that assumes that I'm right. But the notion of yeah. it yeah. hadn't really fully occurred to me at that point um, because you, you know I think you know both of us we, we were so used to reading what uh, all our experts had told us. And it's only when you really get out in the field and start making, uh, you know, real-life comparisons mm. that you start to question all these things that you've been told. Well, that's the point. I and, mean, I, I, uh, I'm not aware of, maybe I've not been looking hard enough, but I'm not aware of anybody else that really made the distinction. No, no, I, I think you're right. And the, the distinction for me is quite profound because in a circle mm. of stone, you feel that you're inside an enclosure. Yes. In a stone circle, you feel you're standing surrounded by a few markers. Yes, yes. I, that I think, makes sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a perfect distinction. Yeah. It's a perfect distinction. Uh, and uh, you see, I, I honestly think that 
Castle Rig, good example. I think Castle Rig is a marketplace. I think it may well have been used for... You know, I made the analogy uh, right at the beginning of Standing With Stones. Do you, you remember when we, we were talking about uh, you, you take a, a, a modern-day church hall? Yeah. Uh, or, or even a stadium, you know, and that on you know on Tuesday night it's Jehovah's Witnesses meet, and uh, yeah. you know Wednesday night it's bingo, and uh, weekends it's a rock concert or it's rugby, uh, you know, and and yet when we apply this to anything megalithic, we're saying oh it's a temple. Uh, I, I think we're completely missing what it is to be human. You know, we we choose a meeting place. And we use it for so many different aspects of social and cultural meaning. Um, And uh, particularly when you look at the location of Castle Rig and its proximity to, uh, you know, sources of of good axe-making stone, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's very likely that its primary use was was an axe market because axes would have been major currency Mm. uh, back then. And the fact that it had uh, this area where, you know, filled with ash over to one side where, uh, you know, there's no human remains or anything have ever been Mm. found. Mm. It's ash. It was a fire. Mm. Um, And I think, you know, why not? You know, you go to somewhere like that and the, you know, the the person who does the most business is the guy that's doing the food, for that's God's right. sake. That's right. And you've got to have somewhere to roast your chest, chestnuts, <laughs> you? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So I, I do. I, you know, I, I think that we're doing our ancestors a, a, a disservice mm. uh, in, uh, in saying all the time that these sites are... Uh, religious and spiritual. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not dismissing the importance of, uh, you know, of the spiritual and, and ritual side of things. I'm just saying we yeah. can't make it all-consuming. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to throw a little googly in, in, into into the mix here, or maybe it's not that much of a googly, if you'll forgive the cricketing um, <laughs> reference. Um, but how about this? If you take away the mounds of Newgrange, Newgrange, Nauf, Down. Mm-hmm. You take the mound away, you're left with a circle of stones. Yes, you are. Um, and that leads me on to think about the Clava Cairns. If you took away the stones of many of those cairns, you'd be left with a circle of stone. Yeah. And Beermore, Beermore. Um, Northern Ireland. Beermore. Beermore. That looks like a robbed out, they look like robbed out cairns. Yes. Where you've got several, seem like circles of stone. Quite complex there. Complex. You, it's it, very it, complex. It, it, it is the yeah. capability brown display of uh, of the period. They could be interpreted, I don't know, uh, as robbed out cairns. And, and there are such things as robbed out, robbed out cairns. Actually, do you know what? That, that's a very interesting point. Uh, when you did the reconstructions of the different phases of Brinketli V. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that's very interesting, you know, that, that the way that usage seems to have changed over... Do well, originally it was a stone circle. Yes. But when the mound was built, it, all encircling? I don't know. The, I don't know, but I think at one stage there, there was... Um, the, the, the circumference was lined with stone. Yeah. yeah. Do you happen to remember? Because I, I confess, I don't remember off the top of my head uh, what the period of time was throughout those phases. Of off the League. top of my head, no, no. no I mean, it was no, a long period of time. I'm, the, what's coming into my head now is I'm just thinking that, uh, in the same way that uh, that you know, now we have a situation where. People, you know, as I said about round pound, you know, you go there, it's it's basically a glorified pig pen, and people tie prayer ribbons all around it. Uh, now, the same applies with when you see the modern day druids uh, having their uh, ceremonies in different sites that arguably could have been observatories. They could, you know, they they could have been all manner mm. of things, but the the modern day druids. 
uh, have, uh, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but you know, they've made a decision that they, you know, they believe that these are places of, or ceremonial places of, uh, of, you know, religious meaning. Um, and mm. and it makes you wonder, you know, when you look back at a site like Brinkethley Thee, where the site usage changed over even maybe a couple of thousand years, it, you know, is it the same thing that actually the descendants had completely lost connection with what it originally had been and uh, and actually had... I seem to remember us having similar thoughts when we were at the Clava Cairns because that, that is a site that's known to have um, changed over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and ha had different uses, and as a result, you get a, a quite a unique um, site. Yes, um, it, it does seem it does seem unique to itself, um, uh, but at the same time, it, it seems hybrid. That's what I'm saying. That was the word. That, that I was is trying to, a, that's a very uh, good uh, word to use. It really is. Mm. Well, to me, this is such an enthralling subject, and we could talk about it for a very, very, very long time. But we can't. So no. But just one more thing yes. before we finish on this. I seem to remember, and I, I, it's just popped into my mind. Aubrey Burl talking about the origins of um, stone circles. I don't think I'm making this up. He put forward the hypothesis that because some of the earliest building megalithic buildings in Ireland, you know, around uh, Newgrange, now and and uh, and that sort of cairn building that has these um, uh, circumferences of stones to restrain the, um, the the mound from slipping away into the earth around, yeah. that in actual fact stone circles aren't just a, a, a bare adaptation um, come from that practice. I just mentioned that in passing. Yeah. It, it just came into my mind. I'd have to look it up to confirm it. But it, wasn't, but it, 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 wasn't it underlies thought. the fact, doesn't it, that, that the truth is we don't know. And, uh, and all we can do is try to make the best sense of, uh, you know, of the evidence that... Keep throwing these thoughts out you know, until uh, something really gels. Yes, into, uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's what it does. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Well, here you go. You that see, here's a question. That we've, we've never yep. really... Uh, we, we haven't even asked each other this question. A, a stone circle or a circle of stones... Which is your favourite of each? Ooh. Um, oh, favourite of each? Yes. So what's your favourite oh. stone circle? My favourite stone circle is... Ooh, challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I, what comes up first it is because of its silliness, and it's, it's a double one, Grey weathers. You're kidding me. Okay. Okay, now that's funny because I actually know, that that's I, mine. Oh really? But, You're kidding. No, 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 okay. that's mine. Isn't because that the thing about yeah. grey weathers is that uh and I don't know if you agree with me on this, grey weathers uh it's two stone circles side by side, and the thing is those stones are really carefully evenly spaced. But when you look at them, yeah, and they're not little—they're not little circles either. They're—they're they're, you know they're pretty big as uh, stone circles go. And also, circumference-wise, worth making yeah. the point that they were uh, the insides of the circles were um, uh, were found to have. Uh, it, it was just a complete layer of ash when they excavated it. They oh, had. They had been. Uh, <laughs> They had been filled with ash. Now, whatever that might mean, we have no idea. But, you know, no human mm. remains or anything like that. It was just ash. That had been a very big, uh, f well, maybe it's where they put their ash. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. But it, uh, the thing about grey weathers for me is that when you look at them, you think they should be circles of stones, but they're not. They're stone circles, mm. and these massive, very, very carefully, evenly spaced circles, one slightly smaller than the other. What is that about? 
and they almost touch, don't they? But how much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember yeah. how much space there is between Very them, little. if anything. The only um, other place I would think of similar uh, would be the Hurlers on Bodmin. Yes. Um, where you've got several stone circles. But I know what question you're going to ask me next. What is your favourite circle of stones? Circles of stone. Uh, Sunken Kirk. Okay. Okay. I think. Oh, no, 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 no. It has to be Roll Right Stones. <laughs> it has, has to yeah. be the Roll Rights. That's where I was taken when I was eight years old and is probably the cause of all this. Yes. Yes. And I'll go along with that. I, I, I think that mine would be actually probably Multiurchaf because of its position. Oh. Um, yeah. And next after Multiurchaf will be Castle Rig, which really is a cathedral for me, even though I don't think it's anything yeah. religious. Yeah. It's just <laughs> glorious. <laughs> Yes. Very, very good indeed. Anyway, we hope you found our little journey through that distinction uh, fascinating, interesting, and uh, provided food for thought. Yes. I mean, I, do you know what? I have no idea what links we're going to put on the website for you to follow up with on this one, but we will no, think quite. of a few. <laughs> oh, we'll, have to, we'll have to write our own. <laughs> Right, well, so it's um, question time, time. And uh, Rupert, I, I believe we have uh, something a little bit different this month. And the question comes from uh, Julie Parkinson. Is that right? Up in Durham. Uh, yes, we did indeed. And uh, Julie asks, uh, the Minoan civilization runs parallel to the Neolithic folks of Britain, very approximately 2600 BC onwards. They were a sophisticated seafaring folk and probably visited Britain. Do you think they could have had any impact on the culture here? Also, do you think the eruption of Santorini in 1613 BC could have had an effect on the climate in Britain? Um, I actually think Julie was picking an average there because we know that it occurred somewhere between 1630 and and 1600. Anyway, and could it have had an impact on the people living here? Now, these are great questions for a number of reasons, and not least of all, because we tend to compartmentalise our megalithic past because it's so shrouded in mystery. So we, uh, for example, uh, we have so much historical evidence for Mediterranean and Middle Eastern culture. Uh, and consequently, we never put the two together. You know, we know nothing about our megalithic ancestors, and we know a load about our Middle Eastern and, Euro and Mediterranean ancestors. So we just, we separate them completely. Yeah, it also really makes you appreciate that if the Romans hadn't completely destroyed the Druid culture, we <laughs> might know a great deal more about megalithic Britain, damn them. That is just so true. It's a very good point. And, and we, we can only remain weeping for the loss of the library at Alexandra. Alexandria. But we yes. digress. Yeah, we do, yes. Well, here, here you go. In a nutshell, because, you know, it, it, their history is very extensive. So without going into that, uh, the Minoans were a Bronze Age culture from Crete. And they existed from roughly 3000 BC to around 1100 BC. And they traded in goods like uh, saffron, ivory, and particularly relevant, I think, to, uh, to Julie's question here, is tin. Now, their known trade extended throughout the Mediterranean, uh, comprehensively throughout the Mediterranean. But it has to be said, there is no actual evidence to suggest that they travelled further afield. Now, the thing is, Julie's quite right when she says they were a sophisticated seafaring folk. But you have to be really careful about saying things like they probably visited Britain because you know we're going back to a time before maps, before satellite views... You know, so your view of the world was uh, was in itself very confined, and uh, and you're talking about a time when a, uh, even if it was a big boat full of 
powerful oarsman, well, those boats travelled at about the same speed as a tiny modern two horsepower outboard motor. You know, it's astonishing the distances those guys travelled at remarkably so slow speeds. Mm. Undoubtedly, they would have been capable of making the voyage, mm. but whether they would have bothered is another question. You know, if you consider the vast amount of time and effort involved, there would have to have been a good economical reason to do it habitually. You know, they had thriving commerce throughout the Mediterranean. So why make a more dangerous voyage of 10 times the distance, mm. essentially to make mm. less money? Mm. You know, there were renowned silver mines not too far away in Larium, which is you know not far south of Athens. So they certainly wouldn't have needed to travel to England to acquire any tin. Mm. You know, they, they had it really mm. fairly close at hand. Um, but, uh, you know, interestingly, though, there, there is a certain amount of anecdotal evidence from people like Herodotus that the Phoenicians travelled to Britain. Now, the Phoenicians came from the Middle East during a period which overlapped the Minoan civilization by a few hundred years. So I, I think the likelihood is that there was probably a degree of contact, but not sufficient to significantly impact on British culture. Mm. But having said that, we also can't avoid the fact that we know very little about British culture of the period anyway. Well, that's right. I mean, the, to, to have the kind of impact um, that um, a foreign uh, culture was going to have on the pre-existing culture, you have mm. to account for an event horizon of influence, i.e. an influx of a substantial number of people. You know, the, yeah. the odd adventurer, the odd explorer, absolutely. I'm sure there were mm -hmm. plenty. You know, there, there wouldn't, you don't become a, a seafaring nation unless you've got uh, people who, who have gone out there and, and paved the, well, not paved the way, not at sea. What do you do at sea? You. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> yeah, um, but to leave an impact to uh, have an influence, then that takes, then we're talking about cultural influence. You've got to have a certain um, yeah, a number of people before that um, impact would register. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, you know, as for the eruption of Thera, uh, uh, now Santorini, um, well, if any of you remember when, when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted back in 1991, uh, well, speaking from a personal point of view, I spent days, and I do mean days, outdoors photographing the amazing sunsets that we were getting in the UK, and all because of an eruption that happened 11,000 kilometres away. You know, now, Mount Pinatubo's eruption ejected a staggering 10 cubic kilometres of rock and ash and gases into the atmosphere. And, uh, and we know that global temperature was reduced by, OK, it was only a tiny amount, but global temperature was reduced for a few years after that eruption. It seems hard to imagine, but the eruption at Santorini was 10 times bigger than that of Mount Pinatubo. And it remains to this day one of the greatest volcanic events known in human history. Uh, it, it threw up 100 cubic kilometres of debris into the atmosphere. Now, I'll put links up on the on the website for people to follow up on stuff like this. 
but B, uh, you'll get all sorts of figures because these uh, uh, volcanic eruptions are measured in all sorts of different ways. And so you'll have figures for dense rock ejector and figures for overall ejector. So I'm talking about overall ejector here. 100 cubic kilometers. Imagine it. It's just incredible. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what the thing is that one way or another, this has a global impact. Uh, you know, and there there was an article published. Oh, it's way back now. Uh, it, was, it was published back in 1995 in the Journal of Environmental Geology, and it describes that Santorini's eruption had a measurable effect on grain crops in China, the bog oaks of England and Ireland. Blimey. The 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 bristle cone pines of California. The extent is absolutely phenomenal. Mm. You know. Mm. So uh, so yes, Julie. In, in answer to your question, probably not a lot of impact on British culture from uh, from the Minoans, but most certainly a global impact from the eruption of Santorini. So uh, there you go. I, I hope that's given you uh, an acceptable answer. Anyway, we'll we'll put uh, we'll put loads of links up on the website for anybody who wants to uh, uh, to look further into this. And uh, yeah, Julie, thanks again for sending in the question. We do like mm -hmm. when people send us questions. Huge thanks to you, Julie. And uh, yes, and as Rupert says, we do like it when we get questions. And uh, don't be afraid to ask. You never know what directions your questions might send us off in. <laughs> Do you? No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> so that's that. Now we can move on to um, our regular slots to uh, finish off with. And this month, I'm going to take the liberty, the grand liberty of rolling both Whimsy and Stonehead of the Month into one. How come, you ask? You'll find out in a moment. Uh, come on then, Michael. So uh, and, and how are you taking this liberty exactly? Well, it's all about me, isn't it, really? <laughs> um, well, it is. Um, the Stonehead of the Month mantle goes this month to not just one person, but uh, uh, a number of people who I've had the privilege of meeting um, oh, over the past uh, uh, week or so. Um, but it segues into uh, whimsy um, because uh, a certain event that I uh, a attended uh, at the invite of these people turned into a bit of whimsy for me. <laughs> okay. So as I say, it's, it's, it's all, all about me, but I want to honour uh, these people that I met and um, also give you a bit of my experience, which I hope helps illuminate uh, something about the minds of our Neolithic uh, ancestors. And also, so whimsy is whimsy, but not, but it's got a serious touch to it as well uh, this month. So anyway, without further ado, I shall announce who the Stoneheads of the Month are. <laughs> Their names are Tim Ashton, Toby Angel, and Martin Fart. The reason, the reasons these three are, I've, I've elected to being stone heads of the month is because they are responsible for, at this present moment, a modern long barrow in the likeness of a Neolithic long barrow being constructed uh, in the Shropshire countryside uh, at this moment. Now, this is a commercial uh, enterprise, and it is as an alternative funerary uh, cremation uh, ceremonial purpose um, for interment. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, though this is a modern enterprise, and these guys, you know, it's a nice idea, and they're doing very well. What they didn't anticipate, on the one hand, 
is the reaction that they get from their potential clients in that although although people may be attracted to the idea of being interred in a long barrow is a sort of romantic idea if they've got any notion of what a long barrow is but when people actually turn up at the site to look at they have a they have a profound uh, more human, more deep relationship uh, that has taken everyone by surprise. And it's taken the owners of the company, uh, Sacred Stones Limited, uh, it's taken them into another area where they suddenly realized they're doing more than providing a service. They're providing something that really connects people, connects people to themselves, connects people to their ancestors, connects them to the earth. And this is an unexpected thing. And these guys have found their passion out of doing this. They have become passionate about um, barrows and that connection to the earth. They feel like they've found their real um, thing that they want to do in life. Although they were already doing it, they're now doubled down and embedded in it, and are passionate stoneheads as a result. It's interesting. Do you do you think this is? Do you think it's something that is innate within us? That I mean, I certainly know from wherever we've been. You know, when we have been inside any barrow. Really, there is something really profound about being uh, seemingly within the earth, and I, I'm just wondering with you know you can get people with you know whether whether they're complete atheists or whether they have mm. you know whatever spiritual beliefs they may have that your relationship with the environment. Where, uh, do you know what I mean? I'm I'm gibbering, but oh, absolutely! But, uh, no, I no, I do I do know exactly what you mean, and uh, I think that is the surprise: is that there is beyond the uh, uh, beyond the appreciation of its being something novel, something you know that uh, honors our heritage and all the rest of it. That there is something innate that um, sparks real emotion. Mm beyond what you'd expect for them, you know, to be looking at coffins, to be looking at headstones, to be buried in the churchyard or looking to yes. where they want to be cremated, that kind of thing. It's a completely different experience. And this was the privilege of being there uh, last um, Monday, was Sunday. it? Um, beginning of last, uh, last, last Sunday uh, at an open day, you know, which was there as an open day for prospective customers, i.e. people who knew who at some point they're going to die and they want to find out where they're, or they want to choose where where they're eventually going to, and you'd think this would be a somber occasion, you know, uh, inspecting their tomb, as it were. But it wasn't. It was so happy, it, it, you know. It it was an open, chatty thing, and people was people were elevated by being in a chamber, looking at where their ashes or something, you know, is going to be interred in this long barrow. It's kind of counterintuitive, but there there it was. Um, so I don't know what that tells us about, you know, our ancestors and how they thought about their lives and, and, and being with the ancestors. And this is the other interesting thing about it for the, uh, families, uh, who will be able to visit the long barrows after the, after the event yes. and be in that chamber with the ancestors with their loved ones it's yes. a different experience for them as well they know where this person is going to be in the landscape and they can go in there and be with them it, on their own I just, it it's, just, it's uh, actually it's very profound on so many levels actually but tell me you you mentioned briefly you you mentioned about the actual building of it the 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 fact that you were really getting into or i say you i i, I mean you know a, a general mm -hmm. you know you being present, but the people building it, uh, this awareness of the problems that would have been faced by our ancestors. Absolutely. Um, I was there with uh, Toby Angel, who uh, is one of the directors of Sacred Stones, and Martin Files, who is a master stonemason, who is also, I think, is a director of Sacred Stones Limited. But he is a master craftsman uh, and, and stonemason. Now, there was a digger on site. The, the tomb, uh, the, the, the long barrow, is unfinished at this moment. It's not covered with it, you know, hasn't got the turf finished on, on it. But sitting on it, you know, uh, and appreciate being around it, uh, really got to appreciate the amount of earth that you need to shift about, you know. So it, it takes something even with a blooming digger 
to shift all that earth about and find enough earth to make a mound like that. Right. And to be sitting there, and I think this is where this crosses over into the whimsy of it, having this experience of sitting <laughs> on top of an unfinished long barrow, how many people get to do that, looking around <laughs> you, you know, from this elevated position up in, up in, up in the air, and actually pondering the uh, problems of where the earth is going to come from a lot of the earth is actually going to come from is has come from a, a dip in front of the uh, portal where a lake will be but i you know i was privileged to have the conversation with the the, the builder and with toby about uh, the practicalities of whether they should have a ring ditch around it are you going to take earth from the ring ditch or not i was <laughs> thinking are you telling me you had this conversation whilst sitting on the barrow itself? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Yes, I, I did. Please sitting, sit tell me you got a photograph. No, I'm sorry, I did. Oh, for God's sake! Uh, uh, no. It is the curse of the photographer that nobody ever takes our photographs. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, in the moment, I, I didn't think of it. But that, 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 was the, that was the whimsy of it, the experience of sitting atop an unfinished barrow. But at the same time, there's a serious aspect to it from our point of view in appreciating that, yes, uh, a lot of earth needed to be shifted, and, of course, there would need a lot of people to do that with, you know, uh, antler picks or... Uh, and, uh, um, yes. shovels and, and that kind of thing a lot of manpower but the other thing was talking to martin is the the the, the, the stonemason is that there would be one person the design and the construction of the thing there would be one master craftsman one master soil engineer in charge that job would not have been communal you would have to have had an expert directing it to get these things in that spot. Neolithic form. A, a Neolithic form. Neolithic project but more, manager. But more than that, a Neolithic pro project manager. Of course. And that, that was, that was, a, that was the, the big sort of takeaway, to be able to have those conversations <laughs> that those guys 5,000 years were having <laughs> sitting on top. That was a takeaway from it. Do you and think there were Neolithic I, Jobsworths? Uh, of course. <laughs> Do we change that much? <laughs> so I, I think I think that's it. I've rolled them into one. I I, I hope uh, I hope that's uh, in. I, I, there are some photographs as you've probably seen on the uh, website on the uh, on the Facebook page. Um, but photographs of me sitting on top of a long barrel. Uh, not so far, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly. I mean, we, because we put photographs of uh, of one of the modern long barrows up. But when did we talk about it? We talked about it a, a couple of podcasts ago, I think. But the fact that you were actually present at the construction of this one, I yeah. uh, I'm very envious that I couldn't be there. Um, but uh, I think to to those three gentlemen, uh, well, we we doff our caps, and it's wonderful that you're doing the work that you're doing. It's yeah. just fantastic. Um, yes, yeah, so if you're listening, uh, Tim, uh, Toby, Martin, thank you for your uh, invitation and uh, uh, for a wonderful day there. Um, yes, and I'm sure we'll be in touch and reporting more on your progress. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think that's about it for uh, this month. That's all we've got to say. We yes. really do hope you've uh, in, enjoyed it. As you say, if you have, consider supporting us on Patreon. Um, but um, beyond that, there's not a lot more to say. Not a lot more to say. We will see you at either the next live broadcast in a couple of weeks' time or on the next podcast. And just yes, thank indeed. you so much for enjoying what we do. Thank you very much. Yes, don't forget the open house uh, coming up in the middle of next month on Facebook, Facebook Live. Not quite sure what date that'll be, but I'm going down to Cornwall and I will probably be, I will be taking more footage to create more uh, stonescape videos while I'm down in Cornwall. So look forward to that. Um, yeah, that's it. Yes. We look forward to being with you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks. Bye. Bye.